So ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinct pleasure to welcome to the stage former U.S. Secretary of Energy and Atlantic Council International Advisory Board member, our good friend Ernie Moniz, who will provide a scene setter for today's discussions with a global tour of new technologies and trends shaping the global energy environment. Uh, Secretary Moniz served as the 13th U.S. Secretary of Energy from 2013 to January 2017. As Secretary, he advanced energy technology innovation, nuclear security and strategic stability, cutting edge capabilities for the American scientific research community, and environmental stewardship. Uh, he now hangs his hat at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, where he's Chief Executive Officer and Co-Chair of the Board of the Directors. Secretary Moniz, with that, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, uh, Fred uh, and, and Jim, for the opportunity to uh, um, address uh, this, this, this group and, and Excellencies, colleagues, and friends. And I want to assure you that those are not exclusive categories. Uh, they, uh, they, they highly overlap, and that includes uh, Sultan and, and Suhail uh, as, as well. The, uh, so uh, I was asked to give a few remarks uh, along the lines of the themes of, of the conference in uh, terms of uh, oil and digitalization and diversification of energy technologies. And let me first say, of course, on the, on the, on the uh, issue of energy geopolitics, of course, that's historically been tied to, uh, to oil. And then in the 1970s, uh, with disruptions uh, in the markets, uh, lead, that led to great change that we see today, uh, the diversification of, 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 of suppliers, uh, the, and uh, often not mentioned enough, the change, the fundamental change in terms of market structures and, and futures, futures trading and the like. Um, uh, but today, uh, uh, with this with this market, uh, of course, we still have a situation where uh, transportation globally is virtually 100 percent, not quite, but very very close to 100 uh, percent, dependent upon oil uh, because of its unique properties. Uh, meaning that, uh, of course, we still have these issues of of energy security uh, to deal with. I might add that, uh, of course, we all know the United States, it's already been stated, uh, by, especially by the Deputy Secretary uh, Bruyette, uh, that the United States now uh, is producing the order of 11 and a half million barrels a day, uh, and this, uh, this raises uh, uh, the discussions about energy independence. Uh, I have to say, uh, uh, despite what my good friend uh, Dan Briette said, that uh, there's a bit of an illusion here uh, in terms of energy independence, and that even includes uh, a possibility in the next decade of having net, uh, uh, net uh, zero imports in the United States of oil and oil products, because the reality is we will remain very tightly uh, coupled to the global market, uh, and we will be as, as exposed as anyone, frankly, uh, to things like price volatility uh, and, and, and those impacts. So, so energy security uh, in, in the oil uh, arena uh, is going to remain a very, very big concern of the United States as we remain engaged uh, in, the global, in the global markets. Now, of course, uh, natural gas is also uh, in that energy security discussion in ways that it was not uh, uh, a couple of couple of decades ago. Uh, uh, gas, with its uh, lower carbon footprint, its very flexible uses uh, across the economy, uh, is very, of course, a very attractive uh, fuel. And then the events in 2014 involving uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, were in some sense uh, the change element in terms of how energy security for natural gas was, was, being, uh, was being viewed. And that led uh, in 2014 to the G7 uh, and the EU coming together uh, in response to the Ukrainian events uh, to issue to think through and issue a new set of energy security principles uh, to guide uh, policy, to guide, uh, to guide action. Let me just say that uh, a first important point of that set of new principles was something that again was alluded to already this morning, namely that energy security is not an individual country's uh, field of play. It is a collective responsibility 
because the insecurity of allies and friends in the energy arena uh, affects, certainly I'll speak for the United States, affects our, our foreign policy in very, very strong ways. So once again, this issue of international engagement is absolutely critical for us all to work together uh, in terms of energy, uh, energy security. Now, on the principles themselves, they of course emphasize the traditional issues of diversification of suppliers and routes uh, of, of delivery, et cetera, em emphasize the importance of developing uh, market structures uh, as an element of security. But what I want to emphasize is I think that, that the statement, while not surprising, was a very clear statement that in addition, the, the efforts to go towards low carbon technology thought of, of course, mainly in terms of addressing global warming uh, and the impacts of climate change, were actually central to an energy security construct as well. Because obviously, uh, renewable fuels, to a large extent nuclear, not quite in the same sense, uh, et cetera, are also elements of, uh, of um, uh, security and frankly may be more relevant towards concepts like energy independence uh, than are uh, some, some of the issues around, around oil, oil and gas. Now, would that, so that is the statement that, again, not surprising, but there's a very, very clear intersection of how we talk about and what we do about energy security and global warming uh, and, and climate change. Indeed, uh, the targets that have been set for climate change, for global warming, we know is in the order of, say, a 50% uh, reduction in emissions uh, globally by mid-century, uh, and in the industrialized world, uh, uh, more like 80% if, in fact, we are to accomplish uh, the goal of remaining uh, below uh, two degrees centigrade uh, warming, for example. Now this is, everyone here knows, to achieve those goals is a massive trans transformation uh, of the energy system. Uh, I certainly believe there is no question uh, that the low carbon trend uh, will be critical, uh, will be a defining element of the energy system over the next decades. Uh, we'll still see uh, uh, how fast, uh, how, how far, uh, but I, the commitments I think are clear. And I would just make two observations. One is, if we are collectively to achieve anything like these kinds of goals, the incumbent energy companies must be part of the solution. Uh, this will not happen only with what I would call disruptors, because the, the incumbents, of course, have uh, control of, own, et cetera, the key infrastructures. Uh, they have the ability uh, to make these transformations as, as they uh, uh, inform their business models going forward to meet the challenges of this uh, carbon transformation. And in fact, I would note that in the United States, obviously the president uh, in 2017 uh, announced the uh, intent to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, and the reality is within days, many, including energy companies, made it clear that they intended to stay the course towards this low carbon future. So I think, I think, I think industry has also stated that what they want is not uh, disruptive policies, but rather stable policies, rules of the road, which can allow business model evolution uh, towards this, uh, this new world. I would add to it as well that I think we have not paid enough attention uh, to the fate of communities in our various countries, uh, because without addressing the needs of communities who are exposed to the transformation, the energy transformation, we will we have tremendous headwinds uh, in trying to implement uh, the kinds of policies and technologies uh, that will lead uh, to uh, to a different outcome. In the United States, uh, that's evident in uh, the need to address uh, communities dependent upon coal. In France, we've just seen the or continue to see perhaps the gilet jaune. Uh, in Africa, we have tremendous energy poverty that we have to address, even in the midst of, 
of major uh, and evolving energy resources. So I think that we have to not only think about this energy transformation, but think about the progressive policies that allow all of our communities uh, to, to move forward uh, and, in fact, uh, provide the ability for policy evolution uh, in, a, in, a, in a more rapid way. Now, that takes us to, to technology. And I have to say, uh, being here in, in Abu Dhabi, I can't resist uh, putting my MIT hat back on and talking about the old collaboration with uh, Dr. Sultan and, uh, and Mazdar. In fact, uh, my last visit here was in uh, May of 2017 to address the graduating class of, of Mazdar, which was uh, uh, following a decade-long uh, collaboration uh, uh, focusing on technology and young people, which uh, Sultan also, also emphasized. But uh, in talking about technology briefly, uh, I'd like to really uh, uh, focus on, on sectoral issues. Uh, the, uh, I mean, I'll just say that, of course, demand side issues, energy efficiency, et cetera, are clearly essential uh, in, uh, in, our, in our path forward. Um, uh, I'll also say that the, uh, in the energy industry, uh, in the energy business, I think uh, we heard what, again, uh, was said this morning in terms of digital technologies and big data uh, and their importance, and that's certainly something I endorse. But I have to say, I think we are still slow on the uptake uh, and uh, barely scratching the surface. And what we term platform technologies, that is not energy technology specifically, but big data technologies and AI, 3D printing, uh, and all of those technologies that are racing ahead, uh, we need to get on top of uh, in terms of being able to, uh, to help our uh, supply chains and, 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 our, and our energy businesses uh, moving, uh, moving forward. But in turning to, um, to sectors, let me first make a few, just a few comments on electricity. Uh, electricity decarbonization is certainly essential and in many ways the lead horse uh, in addressing the low carbon uh, tr uh, transition. In fact, it's been progress in lowering the carbon intensity of electricity that is largely responsible for much of the progress that we have seen uh, in, in various countries, including our own in the United States. Now, in low, the low carbon options are also pretty clear for electricity, renewables, nuclear, and by the way, nuclear, I don't dismiss fusion uh, as well as uh, fission uh, in that equation, and carbon capture and sequestration. Now, on nuclear, let me say, again, the Emirates are a regional leader, uh, as we all know, uh, in nuclear, but everywhere, frankly, certainly including in the United States, cost and schedule challenges are just uh, endemic uh, as the generation three and generation three plus uh, reactors are, are built. I personally think that a transformation in the nuclear business will or will not come uh, with the success of small modular reactors. So I think this is a critical focus. Uh, uh, I think that the reasons are twofold. One is that small modular reactors will allow uh, a new financial engineering approach to these projects, number one. And number two, most critically, will allow for all of the quality control possibilities that a manufacturing environment will, will permit, as opposed to on-site construction, which I can tell you firsthand in the United States right now uh, is causing, again, tremendous uh, cost overruns like a factor of two, uh, which really question the viability of further construction of large uh, nuclear plants. So I think that, uh, that in about a decade we should know uh, the, cost, uh, uh, the cost engineering uh, uh, schedule performance of these reactors, and this could be uh, a major game changer, uh, I think, for nuclear and its contribution uh, to low carbon uh, electricity uh, supply. Now, there is a challenge here, and this is in a segue to renewables. Uh, in, in the United States, we, again, we see it very, very clearly, and that is now the emergence of essentially zero marginal cost 
technologies like wind and solar, uh, for, for example. Uh, the entire regulatory structure in the United States uh, for competitive markets is founded on the principle of marginal cost dispatch. It wasn't designed for a system where one has uh, zero marginal cost technologies, which are in turn subsidized in their capital cost. So I think we are also going to see a need to see a revolution in the policy and regulatory structures uh, to accommodate these different forms of low, of low carbon technologies. Uh, which takes us to, uh, the, uh, to solar in particular, I'll focus on in these, in these few minutes. Uh, as you all know, the costs of solar have been continue to plummet. Uh, we are now talking about $1 per watt uh, for utility solar uh, uh, installations, uh, uh, a rather, in, rather incredible uh, uh, a continuing drop over the last, the last few years. But there are challenges. And we all know the challenges of intermittency, uh, which of course leads to storage and natural gas as, uh, as complements to solar. But we don't often enough talk about the daily production curve of solar, as we all know, there is something called night, uh, for example. Uh, and we also don't talk enough about the fact that solar uh, has considerably more output in the summer than in the winter, which raises the issue of seasonal variation and the requirements of seasonal, seasonal storage. I believe that the only way in the end to manage this in a world with very, very large solar and wind penetration will be fuels. There must be fuels in the system uh, in order to manage these inherent characteristics uh, of, these, uh, of these intermittent and seasonal uh, varying uh, technologies. So storage will have to address minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, uh, uh, all of these scales and I think that we have been a little bit myopic in thinking that batteries, for example, are the solution for all of those timescales. Batteries are more and more critical, clearly. Costs are dropping. Uh, but in the end, uh, I do not believe it's practical uh, for that to be a solution for the longer storage timescales, uh, including, including seasonal. So once again, we're talking about a fuel, for example, uh, and this is not unique, but one example would be uh, producing hydrogen, for example, when one has so-called excess uh, renewable uh, uh, electricity. Now, in saying hydrogen, what I really want to emphasize is that's only one, one possible pathway, but really want to talk about the other sectors. So that, as I've said, electricity is what we focus on a lot, and it's a lot of the early gains uh, in terms of lower carbon uh, along with energy, energy efficiency. But what about transportation, industry, buildings, agriculture? The reality is electricity is a minority of the emissions we are addressing. I'll just take California as an example Transportation, as is the case in many other places, is the largest single emitting sector. We just saw the results from the Rhodium Group about the United States having a very substantial carbon emissions increase last year. What was the lead? Industry up 7.4, I think it was, no, 5.7 percent. Industry increase in emissions. This is the story, if you want to address carbon, you got to go where the carbon is. And transportation and industry are very much more difficult sectors to address than electricity. We need to have more focus uh, in these areas. Now clearly, in transportation, light duty vehicles are amenable, uh, certainly, to battery solutions, fuel cell, uh, fuel cell solutions. Uh, and the like, uh, but that is not a way of addressing the entire sector, heavy-duty vehicles, aircraft, et cetera. 
I believe we are going to have to keep looking as well for low carbon liquid fuels, uh, uh, ideally those compatible with current, current infrastructures uh, if we are moving forward. So these are tremendously important technology directions to be pursued. Uh, natural gas uh, could have a role, L LNG in certain uh, heavy duty vehicle uh, situations, uh, but uh, that also will not be a universal solution. Uh, the, as we look at, the, at these alternatives, we also have to remember infrastructure. We already have three enormously developed infrastructures, oil, gas, electricity. Will we be able to adapt the oil infrastructure to new fuels? Will we, will we be able to sustain a natural gas infrastructure that will be needed at a minimum as a major contributor to a several decade transition uh, to very low carbon? Will we be able to expand the electricity infrastructure in order for it to play a much larger role throughout the energy economy? Will we need a new massive hydrogen infrastructure? Will we need a new massive CO2 infrastructure? These are open questions, but once again, if the incumbents who understand how to manage oil scale infrastructures are not part of the solution, it's hard to see uh, how, one, uh, how, one, how one gets there. In industry, there are things like the need for high quality heat uh, and the like, and we can see several pathways, efficiency, reuse, remanufacturing, recycle, some electrification, biomass feedstocks, carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. And what I really want to finish on in the technology is really emphasizing that we need, in my view, a lot more attention on carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration. Of course, success there will be a game changer for fossil fuels, almost by definition. So let me talk about hydrogen. Now, hydrogen and electricity could be, again, this is not a prediction, could be one way of handling economy-wide energy service uh, requirements. Today, steam methane reforming is, of course, the principal pathway. And I'm going to use a strange unit, six gigajoules, roughly speaking, the energy of a barrel of oil, because that's a nice benchmark to compare. So with SMR, we're talking just over $40 per six gigajoules of hydrogen. With electrolysis, which is the favorite, carbon-free electricity, splitting water to make hydrogen, today those costs are approximately $250 for the same unit. Dramatically more expensive. We have to think about this going forward. In fact, today, if we were to do steam methane reforming, with carbon capture and sequestration, we'd be talking 75 to $80 per six gigajoules, still much less expensive than electrolysis today. Now, we can drive costs down, of course, but I wanna argue that this, in, for this one example, once again, natural gas may be a very, very important part, not only of a transition, but of a uh, asymptotic situation uh, where we are relying on hydrogen as a major part of, of, of reading the economy. But nothing comes cheap. So even in this, let's say, natural gas plus CCS approach, now comes the issue is the issue of will the public accept sequestration of that much carbon dioxide? To give you a scale, one coal plant coal power plant, it uh, produces megatons of CO2 per year. If you put that underground for 50 years from that one plant, to use, again, I'm using units familiar in the oil business, we are talking about billions of barrels of carbon dioxide uh, in geological sequestration. So it gives you an idea. We have, we have cost barriers, we have public acceptance barriers, and we really need to come together uh, in terms of, uh, plot, of, of plotting out the options for a low carbon future. Indeed, another area where I think we are uh, way under investing 
is the whole area of carbon direct removal, which can be from concentrated sources, dilute sources, the air, the oceans. We are not spending enough in terms of developing the options for large-scale utilization of CO2. We have not answered the questions about long-term geological storage or long-term biological sequestration. There's a tremendous palette here of options. The future of how the energy industry evolves and the role of the incumbent companies is going to be dependent in the longer term, mid-century, on answering these questions. So finally, my message pretty clearly, I hope, is, and we've heard it already this morning, innovation in technology, in policy, and in business models is absolutely critical. And we need a large dose of humility in thinking about the pathways to low carbon after five or 10 years. Because there are so many factors, political as well as technological, that our focus should be flexibility and optionality for all of us to meet a low carbon goal in the best way that we can. That's a hell of a lot better than predictions that are completely worthless uh, for several decades uh, down the road. Thank you very much.